Well, good afternoon and welcome to Street Smart, the first in the City Talk series hosted by the University of Tasmania and the City of Hobart. Um, I'm Rufus Black from the University uh, of Tasmania and I'll be uh, facilitating, moderating today's panel. Before I begin, I would like to uh, acknowledge country. Mina Tanapri Tanapri Muanina Nipaluna Latruita Milaidina Pakana Tu. I acknowledge with deep respect the Munina people, Nipaluna country of Hobart, Latruita, Tasmania, Aboriginal land. Today, um, it's also a great pleasure to be welcoming uh, guest speaker, uh, Sky Duncan from uh, Global Designing City, the Global Designing Cities Initiative and our panel featuring uh, the Lord Mayor of Hobart, uh, Councillor Anna Reynolds, uh, the RACT's Chief uh, Member Experience uh, Officer, Stacey Pennicott, uh, and the University of Tasmania's Professor of Human Geography and Planning, uh, Professor Jason Byrne. Now these uh, City Talks, uh, City Talks Hobart, it's a series of events which really aim to inspire ideas and innovation and a public conversation about Hobart's uh, future. Through these webinars and public uh, talks, um, we're interested in that conversation about how we as a community can build back better during and after uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, events. Uh, and so welcome to today's conversation. Just a few housekeeping notes before we uh, uh, invite Sky to kick off uh, today's event. Um, on your uh, computer, your microphone camera chat function and raised hand function have been disabled, uh, so our speakers uh, aren't interrupted. But we do encourage you very much to ask questions, and that can be done uh, at any time using the Q&A uh, function that you've got uh, on your screens. And we'll get a selection of those questions uh, for people to answer during the uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation. Um, and finally, the lecture is being recorded um, for later access on uh, YouTube and uh, SoundCloud channels. But let us get going um, and we'll start with uh, Sky Duncan, who really has a, a, a quite remarkable kind of story. Um, she is uh, director of, global, of the Global Designing Cities Initiative at the National Association of City Transportation Officials, um, a, a really important global uh, group. Um, and Sky and her team produced the award-winning Global Street Design Guide and its recent supplement, Designing Streets for Kids. In support of those global resources, the uh, Global uh, Designing Cities Initiative provides ongoing technical assistance uh, to cities around the world on safe, sustainable street design and mobility. Sky herself is an urban designer with over 15 years experience in architecture and urban, uh, urban design and planning, um, and was recognized as one of Toomey's Remarkable Women in Transportation in 2019. She's worked as a senior urban designer at the New York City Department of City Planning, and as an international urban design consultant, and as an associate professor at Columbia University in New York City, where she studied as a Fulbright uh, scholar. So I'll hand over to uh, Sky to share some global insights and examples of how small cities are doing great things during uh, the COVID recovery and how city streets can adapt to create safer, more sustainable uh, streets for the future. Sky. Amazing. Thank you so much, Vice-Chancellor, and, um, and, and a huge uh, thank you. It's a great honour to be here today with the Lord Mayor and, and such a, an esteemed panel. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to whiz through. Um, I have some very visual presentations um, that I hope can help inspire some of the work um, that's happening in uh, Hobart at the moment. I assume you can all see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. So the focus today, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background and then speak about streets for pandemic response and recovery um, in a bit more detail. Um, but as the Vice Chancellor mentioned, um, I run a group called the Global Designing Cities Initiative as part of NACTO that was launched about um, five years ago. And one of the things that we are most well known for is uh, creating kind of challenging the status quo and creating new design guidance um, for cities around the world. The Global Street Design Guide designing streets for kids, both free uh, downloads, if any of you want to take a look, 
Um, and we're thrilled that we've now had a, over 100 cities and organizations around the world endorse um, this approach of how they design their streets. Um, hopefully, maybe Hobart will be next on the list. Uh, let's see. Um, but the premise behind this work is to really kind of take the outdated hierarchical pyramid where the car has been king. We've basically forgotten about human beings in our cities and to invert that, to prioritize um, people, in particular our kids, elderly, people with disabilities, sustainable mobility options, uh, making sure we can deliver city uh, services and, and goods, and when we have space to give that to private automobiles. And it's, it's of course important we get our new streets and neighborhoods right, but if we don't go and ask what's possible of what we have today, almost like putting on a pair of glasses and seeing our streets in a different way, then we really are never going to be able to address the, the huge collection of challenges um, that we, we are facing today. So the, the Global Street Design Guide works to challenge cities to think about their urban streets so that they can be designed for more functions, um, but also for more people, uh, making sure that they're safe and accessible, uh, healthy and comfortable, but also inspirational and educational as well. Um, and I know I'm really thrilled to know that as part of the Greater Hobart Mobility Vision, this idea of a people-focused city and this kind of focus on streets um, is, is on your radar and a big part of the work you're doing there. Um, as you may guess, I'm pretty obsessed or passionate about streets and part of this reason is that this is our largest continuous network of public space in our city. So therefore it's one of our biggest untapped um, assets that we have in our cities. Yet in city after city after country after country, you know, we've, we've really for the last few decades given that space away, um, you know, that has really provided challenges around our mobility and access. Um, you know, that our decisions around this impact, whether we can take sustainable transportation, how we can walk or bike, or perhaps how we can't access, um, you know, parts of our cities and neighborhoods. And this, this mobility and access is obviously a key theme um, because we want to make sure that our streets are serving more people. And this gets a little bit geeky in the numbers, but actually, if you think about three meters of space, which is a typical travel lane, and we look how many people we can move in that space, we start to see very quickly that um, when we, we can move way more people when we prioritize um, our sustainable modes of transport. Um, and these are private vehicles up here. Um, another way to think about it is the space required to move 50 people on foot or bike or, or car or, or transit. Um, or similarly EV or uh, autonomous vehicle or Uber. Um, so we start to realize very quickly that we have to make decisions around how we want to move people in our cities, um, you know, focus purely on, on kind of private automobiles or in a more sustainable comprehensive way. Um, similarly understanding how the same space might be redesigned to move two and a half times as many people and serve more functions at the same time. So, you know, we're at a time where we have to try and solve different problems around from moving cars to moving people, of course. But mobility and access is not the only challenge, right? Our decisions around how we make our streets and our cities and our neighborhoods designs impacts um, the carbon emissions, the fossil fuels that we burn, how we manage our water systems and whether we're faced with um, increased floods and impervious surfaces. It impacts our biodiversity of our cities um, at the smaller scale and our regional health at the larger scale. It impacts our economic sustainability, how vibrant and thriving our local businesses can be, whether we can deliver goods, um, and how much of our budgets go on infrastructure that maybe only serves a, a small portion of our population. Um, and of course, economic, and I know this is a big issue, I think in Hobart, you've got the fourth biggest uh, challenge around congestion in Australia, um, the amount of time we end up spending um, in stuck in traffic. Of course, our livability and quality of life, whether we can access things easily, take a moment to sit in the shade um, and, and to get to our local stores, um, it impacts our overall mood and, and uh, mental well-being. But some of the most striking numbers are really around our public health and safety. Um, unfortunately, we've got nine out of 10 people now on the planet breathing uh, poisonous air. Um, we now, we also have a, a global crisis around our chronic disease. We've essentially designed physical activity out of our daily lives. Um, and, you know, also what's, what's really devastating is when we look at our road traffic fatalities, um, we are now, 
we're now seeing, um, and I'll just jump through these, sorry. We are now seeing more than um, 1.35 million traffic fatalities every year. And the World Health Organization, um, you know, announced and reminds us that not only is that one person every 23 seconds, but it's now the number one killer of our young people ages five to 29. So instead, you know, we see at our, in our work that streets need to be places for kids and families to, to run around, to play, to walk, um, to learn games, to perhaps pause and read a book or learn to ride a bicycle, um, to be able to facilitate safe movement on, on public transport or fun spaces at transit stops. And so our work has been really working in the last um, five years in helping cities catalyze this change, whether it's examples, um, short-term examples and transformations like here in Bogota um, or large roundabouts, rethinking the real estate of the space in places like Addis Ababa and Ethiopia, sometimes for an afternoon in chalk, going back and doing that with local artists with paint and then triggering capital construction, because we don't, sometimes we have to do things in a, in a way that allows us to trial new ideas. Um, to examples in Brazil, like this one in Drago de Mar, where an area around an art center was completely transformed um, in a matter of hours to really help unlock a new, um, for the community to see their streets in a new light. Um, and they're now scaling this up to do it around schools throughout, um, throughout their city. Um, to Istanbul in Turkey, taking similar strategies. Milan, um, again, rethinking that real estate in a way that can be much more efficient and facilitate movement, but also quality public space. And of course, now in the age of, and the era of COVID, we're now having to think about what that means in terms of our public spaces and how we take transit. Um, so our team has been working for the last few months and we recently released um, Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery, another free download document. Um, and actually, I think tomorrow we're releasing it in about eight different languages around the world. Um, and this is part of a broader approach, a transportation response center that's got lots of resources in case you're in interested in checking it out. But the, the, the goals behind this is to really look at, you know, it's, it's not about having all the answers. We're in a time where there's a lot of emerging practices out there and we wanted to collect those. But we wanted to make sure cities were able to support their most vulnerable people first, um, make sure we're supporting the public health guidance, plan the safer streets for today and tomorrow, you know, as we shift between kind of emergency response and recovery to support our local economies, make sure we're including communities in the process. And of course, acting quickly now, um, but adapting over time. So what we've got in this resource is a collection of different ways that streets offer um, an asset to address the different challenges. Um, so each, there's a whole series of kind of different cut sheets in there that, that you know, give some of the basic technical information and examples from other parts of the world. So some of the themes that that focus, focuses on is of course, movement. We talked about this earlier. How do we make sure we have wider sidewalks, safer crossings, more space for people to, for families to bike safely, um, the transit access and, and looking at actually reducing speeds in certain cases. And we see examples of this, you know, uh, moves in Auckland, widening their sidewalks. Um, Milan overnight, and I know this is not a small city, um, but we can talk about this in the discussion. I don't think it's all about the city size here. Um, but we, you know, cities like Milan overnight really kind of just going out and painting, you know, kilometers and kilometers of new bike facilities. Tirana and Albania doing the same thing so that kids were able to get around uh, more safely. Uh, New York, again, looking at the interactions of, of safe movement from bikes and transit. Um, similar examples coming out of France, thinking about the intersections. Latvia having examples of how they can repaint their streets and reduce speed limits um, and extend their curves. And cities like Bogota and Colombia making, uh, making the very strong, bold political call to reduce their speed limits across the city uh, to be a maximum of 50 kilometers an hour. But also our streets, um, as we mentioned earlier, provide other functions. So making sure that we're supporting our local economies and the ability to provide critical services so whether that's medical testing, pickup and delivery for businesses, rethinking how outdoor markets and dinings can happen. Um, we see examples of, of this in South Africa, in San Francisco, how they've been working to um, support the, the homeless 
they're think, rethinking about sanitation at transit stops like here in Brazil or Myanmar, how they're transforming their, how their markets are, are um, being implemented and function on a daily basis. To the outdoor dining that we see, Lithuania was one of the first cities to kind of go public um, with the sorry countries and you know even more recently we're seeing a huge um, growth in New York City the open streets program um, and I was excited yesterday to see that this has now helped inspire cities I know it's not Hobart but a little closer to home in Melbourne now the investment to support um, local businesses in in this recovery through things like restaurants and dining but of course um, now that our gyms are closed and we're not venturing quite so far from home, uh, making sure we're thinking about our streets also as places for recreation and play and exercise. Um, so we see examples in Berlin where they've been closing streets and, and giving more space for kids and families for playing and gathering. Some cities like Brasilia and Brazil doing this on a temporary basis. So closing um, on Sundays, many kilometers of streets for families to get out in a physically distanced way. Um, Paris rethinking the spaces outside the schools there, similar strategies in Wuhan. Um, and again, just a, a couple of days ago, um, they're literally, you know, taking vehicles out of streets, uh, this little 12th street in New York, rolling out um, carpet and spaces. And again, kind of repopulating the, the local businesses there and giving more space um, for physical distancing. Um, but of course, you know, we're, we've got multiple crises going on at the moment and, you know, the systemic inequities um, that we face um, are also very, very strong. And so making sure our streets provide the platform for safe protesting, um, you know, and we see examples of this, of this um, throughout the world, but, but some of also some of the celebrations, right, um, examples of streets of spaces for weddings, um, for religious um, praying and, and celebration as well. So I know uh, this is very quick, and I, but I really want to get to the conversation and just to remind ourselves that, you know, for you guys in Hobart, and I know you're in a pretty good place right now, similar to many parts of um, New Zealand right now, and I feel extraordinarily lucky um, of where we sit on this COVID kind of recovery and crisis stage. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so it's really important that we are prepared. And I highly encourage you, and I know that you're already doing this, to think about the streets as part of the solution um, of the many different crises we're facing, not only COVID, but the other ones, the big tsunami waves that are following this that we, we have to face. Because we really, we cannot afford to return to the kind of inequitable and the very dangerous and unsustainable patterns that we, we had of the past. So we, we hope that this work that we do, um, and, and I'm sure the wonderful work that's to come in Hobart, can help to um, inspire cities around the world in, in providing the foundation for recovery for, for our next generation. So I will stop there, happy to send around any links of any of this material that might be helpful and, and really excited um, to be part of this conversation today. Thanks for the time. Sky, look, thank you very much and kind of inspiring, kind of extraordinary set of uh, ideas and images to get us going. I'm actually going to start with one of the questions that uh, uh, has come from uh, our audience, um, which is a kind of really where do we begin if we're a city like Hobart? The questions, what measures would you recommend for cities around the 50,000, 250,000 inhabitants to make streets both pandemic safe and encouraging for movement of people? You gave us lots of kind of illustrations. Um, where do we begin? Well, I think one of the, the key things to remember is that change can be really scary and it can be really hard. Um, and so working with local communities, you guys obviously have the political will in, in Hobart, which is one huge step up than many other parts of the world. So I would say then working with folks like the university yourselves and, and others in the community to identify where are their local champions that are willing to try something a little bit different. Um, use that as a, as a way to start. Um, you don't have to do all capital change immediately. I would say get yourself some paint, some planters, some signs, some cones, and work with some local artists if you can. Get some color in there. Work with kids if you can. Working around schools is a great start. Um, and just try it. Just act now, like give something a go and collect some metrics. Um, I mean, I could talk for weeks about this. I won't, but it's really important when we do these temporary projects or interim or trial projects 
that we can collect some before and afters. We can do surveys, we can measure the speeds before and after, we can do counts, we can look at how long people spend time in spaces, um, because that allows us to have a more equitable conversation around um, what our streets should be and who they should serve. Unfortunately, we often end up with the, the loudest um, minority um, who objects, obviously tends to be the people who don't want the change are the loudest objectors. And so it's really important we find ways to broaden um, the folks who can be involved in this conversation and who really do want a more sustainable future. They want their kids to stay alive. They don't want their kids to die getting to school or to be breathing poisonous air. And they don't want to be functioning as their taxi drivers for you know five hours after school every day. So I think there is the will out there. So it's important to try and, and go to places and start where there is some political will, um, both from the government, but also from local communities. So that would be my suggestion as, as a starting point. Um, Great. And don't uh, be that... scared that you're small. <laughs> it really <laughs> doesn't matter that um, you're a small city. No, look, thank you. Thank you for that, Sky. I might uh, turn to you, Lord Mayor, and ask you if, you know, Council's done a terrific amount of work on questions of sustainability and where we head for the city, hearing what Sky is observing. What role do you see uh, kind of early action on our streets playing in our recovery from, from COVID? You're muted, Anna. That's the, the classic thing that always happens with Zoom. Um, thank you, Sky. That was great and really inspiring to see all of those uh, examples. And uh, thanks for your question, Rufus. I, I wanted to just mention that I think the, um, obviously this year has been very difficult for everybody, uh, but one of the very um, strong bits of feedback I've had from our community about COVID is uh, that people have really appreciated getting to know their neighbourhoods better. Uh, and we are very lucky in Hobart that we have very distinct neighbourhoods. Uh, we've still got um, some local shopping strips. We've got access to uh, bushland and bushland tracks and parks in most of our in most of our neighbourhoods. So we're we're quite blessed that we can um, we can really um, build up that uh, that that strong characteristic that we already have and and build on that. Uh, because it, it seems as though a global trend uh, around the world is that people are interested in staying in their neighbourhoods. Uh, they're, they're working from home and then they obviously want to get out of home for a break. But they, they, um, we were restricted in our movements at one stage, but people are getting to rediscover the good things about their neighbourhoods. And people said to me, you know, I didn't even realise this track was in my in our neighbourhood or this park, uh, because normally if they had time off, they'd go further afield in their car. So I think um, that was something I really noticed. And the role that we can play is to um, enhance those, those neighbourhood centres. Uh, we've already done a bit of that over the last few years with a couple of um, street upgrades of our shopping strips to try and really um, back in the, the local businesses. But I think there, there's more um, that we can do with encouraging community events uh, and um, uh, and just in enhancing the walkability of, of, of uh, the local neighbourhood so that people really can appreciate that uh, as well. The, um, the interesting thing about Hobart is that we also do have a CBD. So we've got these neighbourhoods, but we also have a CBD and... Uh, uh, we are keen to ensure also that people don't just stay in their neighbourhoods but still feel welcome to come back to the CBD. Uh, and that's a really important uh, strategic um, goal for us as a city because uh, the CBD is very much the economic driver of our city. So uh, we have uh, said to our hospitality sector that if they'd like to have more outdoor dining, we'd be happy to help work with them to expand their footprint outside. And we've just been, we're still coming out of winter here, so we haven't had a lot of take up uh, from that, but we're hoping that the sector does come and um, we can assist them. Uh, and as part of that, we are applying to lower our speed limits to 40 kilometres an hour in most of our shopping districts um, so that we can have uh, the, the more people out in the street and outdoor dining and it's, and it's safer. Uh, so we're making that application to the state government who makes uh, that decision. 
Great. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Stacey, if I, if I can turn to you, the RACT uh, put out a uh, mobility vision, which I thought was completely inspiring. An automobile association would put out a plan that wasn't about cars. Um, I mean, just fantastically disruptive, great thing to do. Um, COVID offers us some opportunities that Sky is highlighting to kind of get started on some of the um, uh, ideas that you put out there about creating a broader set of ways we're dealing with mobility in the city. For, given the plan you laid out, where do you think we should be, uh, we should be starting? Well, oh, thank you, Vice-Chancellor. It's, it's been very interesting because when we put out our vision, uh, we were really um, experiencing congestion issues um, throughout Hobart and obviously with um, the um, vehicles coming off the road and the change in habits, that congestion has gone away. And I think uh, what we need to do is actually take away and learn from that experience to show that we don't need to build our way uh, out of traffic congestion. We actually need to change behaviours. And some of those behaviours come with policies, uh, with the ways that uh, businesses, schools, uh, how they operate as well. So some really simple change behaviours about work times, where you work, where, whether you work from home and how you move around the city. And it doesn't necessarily have to be through building bigger highways to get into cities. Uh, and secondary, uh, we have proven out that people will cycle, they will walk, they do want to get out even in winter. And so we shouldn't assume that people don't want to look at different ways of moving about the city. And as people slowly come back, make sure we don't go back to the bad habits. Great. Like I think it's there are fantastic set of observations about the behavioural change we've we've actually seen and building on it. And a question we've had come in, which I might um, head towards you, Jason. Uh, it's a really it's a question, um, and I think it's about the journey from where we are to where we might be. The question's around. Um, how do we move for, I'll just slightly paraphrase it, from just um, tinkering, um, some tactical interventions um, with, you know, uh, to a really, tr you know, particularly things like bike lanes and so on, to having a true kind of network of safe routes and other mobility kind of improvements in the city? What, because I saw you nodding quite a lot when Sky was talking about the tactical interventions. Um, and so I'm wondering how you as a geographer think about that journey from helping a city come to terms with some new ways of dealing with the streets to this actually starting to really transform at us at scale, um, how we're treating our, our streets and our mobility. What, how, do we, how do we go on that journey? Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Well, I was definitely nodding. I felt like my head was going to fall off at one point there. <laughs> uh, Sky and I are very much kindred spirits in the way that we look at cities. And I might share my screen if that's okay to give some Please, examples. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I particularly liked uh, Sky's uh, uh, illustration of looking through a different prism or a different set of glasses. So for me, this is all about lively streets and how do we enable our streets to become more lively and more vibrant. And that uh, key point that Sky made about scaling up. Uh, so for example, we know that COVID-19 is impacting our cities in very profound ways. We're already seeing vacancy rates rise across uh, cities. Um, the idea of tinkering though, I don't think should be downplayed. I think that tinkering has a lot to go for it, Vice Chancellor. So if we look at uh, this example here in the middle, this middle photograph from Japan, uh, this is greening the city on a very small scale with little pots and planters and bicycle racks outside a small neighborhood restaurant. But it's created a very vibrant, lively, attractive uh, space that people want to feel connected to. Uh, and then once you, once you have started with these local experiments, you can scale up like this example we see in Launceston. Uh, with the redevelopment in uh, in the city centre, with benches and and places where people can sit in the shade, uh, so I think scaling is key here. Uh, and the other thing that Sky said that really uh, appealed to me, Vice Chancellor, was the idea of addressing inequalities first. Uh, and here I'm focusing on children who are often one of the most overlooked. Uh, group of residents in our cities. Uh, this is from Tokyo. And here you can see a play area that uh, someone's thought would be a good idea uh, to put up on a, uh, the side of a street next to a building. 
uh, but you can't even climb the wall to get to the slide. Uh, and it would be really, really hot in the sun. You'd likely get burnt in the summer if you were sliding down that slide. It's metal, it's unfriendly, it's unwelcoming. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, on the other image, you see a more rambunctious, um, low key informal sort of space that's highly attractive. So I think we, we shouldn't be afraid of tinkering and but doing it in a way that we speak to our stakeholders first, including children as key stakeholders. And that, that then helps us to focus on supporting our local economies and scaling up because if children are in the city that you can see they're bringing their parents with them, uh, they will spend money, they want to stay around and, uh, and enjoy these sort of sticky spaces. So uh, scale and, and, and uh, the idea of scaling up, I think is critically important here. And then one last thing, if I might um, beg your indulgence, I think putting on these glasses to look a little bit differently, uh, this is uh, the Argyle Street car park just outside in, uh, in Hobart near Purdy's Mart. Uh, when you walk out and you see the beautiful public art of the handfish, I always want to do something more to this space. I want to plant some trees and put some fairy lights in the trees and I want to pull the cars out and I want to green up that courtyard and I want to activate the back alleys here that don't look very welcoming. They look a bit hostile uh, and put affordable housing in, convert those lower ground levels to, um, to places where people on low incomes, for example, could afford to live. And even if these are just low scale temporary interventions, it enables us to create these kind of human focused sticky spaces where we want to interact with each other. Uh, so I, I think we shouldn't be afraid of these tinkerings and these small experiments. We can learn from them. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid to fail either, and that will enable us to, to scale up. So I'll stop sharing, and hopefully um, that's started to answer the question a little bit. Yeah, well, I might pick that up and um, take that um, on back to you, Stacey, uh, back to you, Sky, and ask uh, this question of kind of the journey, though, scaling, uh, um, scaling up. How do we take those? Because you had some examples of cities that really kind of taken this and, um, and changed their cities. Can you talk to us about the journey with, with uh, kind of the wider public? Because a bunch of these things, as you highlighted, took a fair bit of political courage to uh, pull off. What's the kind of role of communities and leaders in getting in taking us in engaging this journey? Well, it's it's really critical, Rufus. And um, you know, just before I jump on that, I do want to touch on something that all the question and you posed to Jason, this idea of tinkering, right? And, and versus the big scale moves. And I think absolutely tinkering can be very, very powerful because tinkering can be the catalyst to unlock you know, larger impact and scaled up efforts for sure. But I, I do agree to some degree with the, um, the question that came through is that we can't only tinker, right? We do also actually have to address a lot of the big picture challenges that break down the silos in city governments and in and, and setting our vision and, and really closely coordinate our decisions around density, land use mix, transportation planning. Um, and I think, you know, we see in our investments in, in transit, if we are asking people to take alternatives and leave their car at home, not to say they can't own a car or they can't ever drive, it's not about being anti-car, but it's about being pro-choice and giving people realistic, affordable, viable, comfortable options, alternative options that they can choose. Um, so we do actually have to put our money a little bit where our mouth is in terms of investing in transit, investing in how we design our neighborhoods and our cities. Um, but of course, we can't do that overnight um, across the board. And that's where working with local communities becomes really critical, as I mentioned, to kind of help identify where the local champions are, where the kind of entry point is to, to catalyze change. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think working with, working with kids, working with local nonprofits, um, understanding that sometimes things won't work. Like we've certainly done projects in cities where we've realized, you know what, that, that didn't work, right? That got a huge amount of protest. That community is not ready for this kind of change right now. And we don't have unlimited funding. So let's go and invest in a place where people want the change, where we know it's not gonna get torn out or huge protests and that we can actually do the metrics that we talked about and understand how we can refine that for a citywide impact. Um, and so I think, you know, working, it, it's a balance really. I think you, you've got to have the community input, but you do need the political will, you know, the folks who are making the budget, setting the visions to make, to make this 
um, a, a different reality. And, and we see small cities also doing pretty incredible stuff, um, you know, not quite the 200 scale, but more around the 400,000 scale population. You look at cities like Helsinki and Oslo, right, who have transformed their downtowns. And they're one of the first cities in the world to achieve zero pedestrian fatalities in the downtown. You see small cities of like 200,000 uh, Brescia, you've probably never heard of it in, in Northern Italy where the city has actually funded and paid for, and it's free for every citizen, um, bike share and electric bike share systems. And so that in addressing that inequity, they're not just saying, oh, okay, biking's for those in Lycra or who can afford to go and buy a bike. They're really giving all the, safe, the safety options and the access to those different modes. Um, many other cities have free public transport, right? They end up choosing to subsidize that. And I think, We've got, I think, in New Zealand and Australia and a lot of our kind of Australasian world, we've got this, um, we've kind of forgotten that public transportation and public mobility is a public good, right? Like we, we don't look to make money off our schools or our libraries, um, but, you know, we, we seem to kind of not want to make those same investments in, in the public good of, of moving people safely and giving those choices around there. Um, <laughs> One of the questions uh, we've got from our, our audience, which um, plays right into this kind of part of the conversation is getting that change, you know, livable space is a really important priority, uh, our question asker says, but um, what are the, how do we actually get approaches that do disincentivize private motor vehicle use and incentivize people into these other transports? And as if I can add to that, what do we do about the questions where, because we saw your wonderful pictures and an awful lot of parkings eliminated and often people will say, well, how are people going to get to my, you know, my business, my area, if, if there's no parking outside, how, how do they do that? And particularly in Hobart, where it uh, seems all too easy to park pretty much in front of wherever you want to go half the time. Um, uh, how do we get that change happening and, and I wonder perhaps a quick word from all four of our panelists because this kind of changing uh, that mode is really important perhaps I'll, I'll start with you Stacey and then Anna and Jason and back to Sky what, what do we do to get this shift yeah absolutely um, what we hear time and time again is people won't shift whilst it is so easy uh, and there are not alternative options and so we need to understand why people are taking that option of a motor vehicle uh, and what we hear in Hobart in particular is that the other options are actually more expensive uh, the timetables don't run to what they need to do and they can't do what they need to do throughout their journey, which might be to stop off and get their groceries or it might be to drop their children at sport. Uh, so until we can look at all of those things together, uh, until we can provide an option that makes it easier for those individuals to do what they need to do, we won't disincentivise the use of the car unless we have very extreme measures which you know are unpopular and probably won't work in a political sense. So really understanding why people take that journey and make that choice and addressing that holistically to ensure that they can get where they want to go when they want to go uh, and and as quickly and easily as possible thanks stacy what's your take on this lord mayor thank you uh yeah it's it's tricky isn't it i think you do have to identify where um where you can have most impact uh, with with the least resistance or the easiest it's as much about organizing things uh, and I really feel that the journey to work is a, is a really important place to start uh, with trying to get more people out of their their single vehicles and into uh, public transport because not not every journey to work is to just literally to one place but there's a certain percentage of workers that that are just traveling making one simple journey from home uh, into an office and then back again and for those folks you know, if the employers working with our state government and councils can uh, get to know the transit system even a couple of times a, a week and have some incentive for doing that, then we're starting to just get people from always picking up the keys off the kitchen bench and sort of always using the car. But this idea of thinking about, well, you know, maybe today I'll, um, you know, for some reason, because I'm getting some incentive, I will catch the bus uh, or it makes my day easier on this particular uh, day. So I think the journey to work is a really important place that we can uh, get some good change. And then going back to my earlier discussion about neighbourhoods, 
uh, in terms of people understanding and seeing the benefits of of walking and making um, streets more uh, people friendly. I think again, if that can be done at the neighbourhood level, um, it's a it's a way that people can experience that very practically in their own lives. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Well, I of course would echo everything everyone else has said, but I think the key message for me is. Uh, enabling transit modes that are safe and convenient and flexible. And one of the things that uh, COVID-19 taught us very quickly is that as soon as we uh, were forced to stay at home and began walking around our neighbourhoods, we would see the footpaths that were cracked or, or that had inclines sideways. So you imagine being a parent pushing a stroller, that's not very convenient or safe and uh, with your children. Or jumping on a bike and finding a bike lane that runs out halfway along the road and then appears later. Uh, or public transit services where you check the timetable and you're waiting, uh, the bus is due five minutes from now and half an hour later it still hasn't arrived. So we, we need to change the way our cities work by doing some simple things, I think. Um, people are appalled at the idea of saying that we, we should pull cars out of the city because it will affect retail trade, as you mentioned, Vice Chancellor. But in fact, more people walking past the front of shops increases the profitability of those shops. People are constantly dropping in. Having bike racks nearby for tricycles, for example, where you could put um, not only having your, your child with you on the bike, but put goods in the back um, and even electric tricycles where they can, they can be recharged quickly, right? So some small changes here, I think, could uh, catalyze a big shift. Um, and then I guess finally joined up thinking here is what I would like to emphasize, Vice Chancellor. So uh, if we have the intercity cycleway, for example, in Hobart, which is a wonderful piece of infrastructure, put some playgrounds next door to it. Um, put a cafe there so that someone uh, could easily um, watch their kids and have a cup of coffee or better still start a small farmer's market where people nearby, local farmers or people who've been struggling to sell their produce can align themselves with that space and begin to sell their wares while people are cycling past. So I, I think these step changes are achievable. Uh, the final one is turn up and go public transport um, where you can track it on your smartphone. You can see where the bus is. You don't have to wait for a timetable. You know when you can, when you can meet that bus. Great. Look, thank you, Jason. Um, Sky, I might take us in a slightly different direction. We've got some really interesting kind of questions here, which kind of come back to the COVID, uh, COVID challenge um, about what we do where we've got vacated spaces. And one person has quite fairly observed that the university has some of these spaces in the, uh, in the city. Um, but it's looking like a challenge in all sorts of cities that um, as businesses close down, um, that we end up with quite a lot of vacant uh, space. And we've certainly got that here in Hobart and Launceston. Um, what do we do about this challenge? Um, and they come in, you know, from shop fronts through to larger spaces. Um, what are cities doing to respond to what's happening to their, uh, the viability of, of the economic activity in the heart of them and, and the holes that's leaving? Yeah, look, it's a great question, Rufus, and I think we're still we're still learning, right? We're still looking. Cities are still trialing things out here, um, but I think when we do have vacant space in our cities, I think this is an a, an incredible opportunity to be creative um, around who we're working with and and looking at people who need space um, and those who have space, and how can we maybe look at connecting some more unconventional dots. Um, there was a, there's a great group in Christchurch here that after the earthquake, which had, you know, now a decade of vacancies, um, you know, with, after the big earthquake there called Gap Filler, right? And, and how do you work with kind of local startups with office share? How do you, and one of the triggers, um, I believe, and it was, it's been a few years since I've worked in this space more directly, but is some of the insurance requirements. And so how might you get the insurance companies in to start to think about like who can use that space and what are the liabilities? And that's often why some of the bigger companies or some of the bigger um, landlords don't want others to use the space because of different liability issues. But I don't think any of that is unsolvable. I think we do just have to think a little more creatively in a, in a, in a different way about this. Um, you know, I think we, going back to some of the, topics that you guys were just chatting on I think it's really important that we remember that it's not our cars that do our shopping it's it's the people and so if we go back to thinking about 
putting people first, the types of places that people want to be and spend time, um, then hopefully that can get incorporated with how we rethink some of these vacant spaces and ensure that those are places that can attract folks um, back to the neighborhoods, back to um, the, the, the downtowns or where these vacancies exist. It's an incredibly creative um, opportunity. And, I, and you know, I don't say that lightly because I don't wanna be, it's really difficult. I don't think we want to be opportunistic around the very real struggle that is happening but because of COVID. Um, so I'm not saying it in that way, but I, but I do think it's important that we think outside the box a little bit um, in this. And while we're in this kind of COVID, uh, how our space adapts to the COVID piece, so uh, a question here right in this in this territory, and I think picking up on some of the images you showed of COVID adaptions, mm -hmm. um, uh, the questions you know, with artist and community-led public activations and tactical urban projects which aim to encourage lively streets, do the panelists have thoughts on where to from here with the challenge of gathering people in public spaces in a time of uh, COVID and post COVID, how do we do this when we need to uh, ensuring social distances are being met? What are, you, what are you seeing around the world skies, how we do this? Well, that, that is exactly where the street comes in because um, we need, it's, it's an asset in that it's more space. Right. So for schools or that don't have enough footprint or enough play space to fit all their kids, the adjacent street and a lot of cities around the world are now doing this, are being closed. So there's more space so they can learn outside or have more still be active and lively, but in a physical distance manner. You know, the same thing happening with restaurants. Um, they can't most places you can't have the restaurants inside at the moment still. Right. So the street can be transformed to allow that physical distancing, but still allow a form of gathering in a, in a safer fashion. Um, so we certainly don't, you know, again, we're in the thick of this. We don't have all the answers, but we do have emerging practices that people are trialing and we're learning from constantly on a daily basis. Um, but that's where I just I kind of can't emphasize enough how important it is to take the street as and think about the value of that, right? We're really good in um, private real estate to put a dollar amount and a value to every square meter or square inch of space that we have. And yet we kind of take for granted the public space that we have and who that serves and how we distribute it and who we give it to. Um, so this is a chance to flip that on its head a little bit and, and think we, we need more of that space for safe movement, for um, helping our communities and our businesses and our kind of downtowns stay vibrant. It's a new form of vibrant, maybe not the same as it was pre-COVID, but it's still important. We're still human beings and we like to be around other people, even if in a distanced way. Lord Mayor, I'm wondering if we can come to you, but uh, Jason just uh, was uh, in response to this, uh, just shot me a note, which I really love. Um, and it's a kind of an interesting challenge to us as a city um, in response to what do we do with the streets, widen the footpaths, close streets temporarily, add in planter boxes and public art, provide some shelter for the rain and sun, enable young people to listen to music in the streets in the place of nightclubs. Where, where can the council help us go on this? We've heard just how important it is to reclaim the streets. Lord Mayor, where's your thinking heading after the discussion we've had so far? Well, I think it's absolutely right that we've got to inspire people to get back out in this, out in their cities. And uh, I mean, Hobart is um, is in a better place because people aren't feeling scared, but there are still uh, less people around because uh, people have got very comfortable with you know, Netflix and Uber Eats and, you know, all their favourite restaurants are actually delivering rather than uh, having to go out. Uh, and so I really see that we actually have to do some really interesting things to remind people that being out in their city, in their places with their fellow residents and citizens is actually is a great, um, is a great experience. And if, and if we fail in that respect, there'll be a lot of businesses that continue to decline. So it's uh, it's actually quite an important economic uh, recovery uh, strategy for the council to ensure that people are feeling uh, inspired but confident. And there is that 
there is going to be that sweet spot about how do we activate without bringing too many people together all at once. And we're struggling at the moment with what we do with New Year's Eve because, uh, you know, we used to have 10, 20, I'm not sure exactly, 30,000 people on our waterfront. Uh, and we can't really uh, do that, but to organise 10 different smaller events is beyond our resources. So there are some challenges, I think, for councils here, but um, but it's, it's, it's what we have to do because unless we're working with businesses and residents to uh, get them excited about re-entering the, the public realm, people will... Uh, a lot of people anyway will choose to just uh, stay at home with the convenience and safety of, of, of staying at home. If I can, um, uh, as we look at how we get all of that um, happening, um, there are of course terrific qualities that the city has and somebody uh, has observed, how do we do these new interventions while preserving the, and perhaps even enhancing um, the great qualities we've got in the city. So, you know, some amazing heritage pieces and remarkable kind of connections and views. Um, I think Sky, some of those images you put could cause alarm to some as we get out the coloured paint and uh, tear up the town. Always wash um, it away and take it away. <laughs> uh, but I think there is a piece here where you've got a city with some really precious qualities to it. Um, how do we do these tactical interventions that help uh, people go on the journey around um, not turning our back on the wonderful qualities, but sort of building on them. What, what? Because a lot of the interventions are actually in, in some cities that perhaps were not so lovable uh, um, in some of their intrinsic qualities, perhaps. Um, uh, what do we do in a city like Hobart, which has these things people, you know, will go to the barricades on? Um, uh, how do we how do we manage that? Well, I mean, I, th I think every every person in the world loves their something about their neighbourhood, right? So that doesn't, or their city. And so, yes, it's something different, but I don't think it makes Hobart unique in that way. Um, I think, you know, yes, it's beautiful, but there's all, you know, there's beautiful aspects of every part of the world. And so I think, again, doing something in a, in a quick temporary way or an interim way allows actually what we often do is then that platform, that temporary space, that's not a permanent design and maybe it does rack some people up and get some attention, but that can then actually be a platform to have a real conversation around some of these changes that are, that are needed. Um, because what can often happen is we get paralyzed to the point of inaction because we're worried that we're not going to please absolutely everyone. And, and the reality is we are never, one is never going to be able to please 100% of any group of anything, right? We're a diverse population of people. We have different values. And so that's one of the big benefits of, of using this kind of interim strategy is it gives the platform for those conversations to be had. It doesn't mean that that is the permanent solution, but it means you've then got a space that people can come to, can see, can debate, can hate it, can love it, can fight for it, can tear it apart. Um, but then you get one step closer to having those very real conversations rather than just sitting back and debating it back and forth. And then nothing happens. And then another political administration changes and we still have the same challenges that we're faced with from climate change and road safety and polluted air and, you know, congestion and all the rest of it. Um, so we, we have to try things. We have to, we have to accept some level of change, right? If we sat back and said, uh, you know, back in the day of horse and cart. No, no, we're good here. We don't need any advancement or we don't need to rethink or if we did the same thing with medical technology, right, from 200 years ago or the same thing with mobility or, our, you know, our phone technology. If we said, no, 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 we're good. We don't need any change. So, you know, it, it is hard, but um, I, think, I think it's necessary. And I think there's, it really, it's not going to be a matter of... Um, if at this stage, I think it's more a matter of when, and I think some cities are going to be, I mean, all the evidence is there now. So some cities are going to be the ones to take the bull by the horns to be the global trendsetters um, and to show what's possible and others will be lagging for a long time. And unfortunately then their citizens suffering for a lot longer. Um, 
Well, we definitely want to be the uh, not one of those sort of cities. Um, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes to go. Jason, you, I think you might have had a couple of examples. Do you have those to hand of kind of stuff you've seen that's kind of already working that might help give us that sense we can do this? I do, Rufus, and I'd love to share them. And then I might come to both uh, Anna and Stacey on this kind of theme of we can do this um, and what, uh, what your reflections would be on how we, how we get on this journey. But Jason, why don't you share a couple of your we can do this kind of pictures? Sure. So this is, uh, this is North Hobart. And uh, you can see here uh, a street with a slightly wider pavement. But what really impressed me when I first came to Hobart and, and found this uh, amazing little laneway uh, is the combination of street art, uh, which is pretty low key, uh, and some amazing furniture and, and nice planters and and uh, and good and good planter boxes combined with the um, activating the space on the side, so it's not just a an alleyway, but providing a window where people can stop by and pick up a coffee or get some bakery uh, bakery bakery produce. This is a really great example of something that we already have in our city, and it's working extremely well. Uh, a couple of other examples I'll just quickly work through if I may. So you can imagine just with a little bit of, of creativity here, taking a laneway um, and you know you can put a couple of chairs and tables in there and that's low key, but with a bit of pavement treatment and, uh, and some greening, uh, you can create really beautiful spaces in the city that people love to come to and, uh, and hang out in and, and relax in. Uh, here's an example from Launceston where they've been doing it something a bit more high key uh, but again, um, shop top housing, um, paving, good places for, for uh, people to walk, but unfortunately not as much greening in here as you would like. Or even just some of the low key ideas. I love these. This one's from Ridgeway up the top where someone's made their own ride share on a, um, on a bench, just with a sign saying, if you want a ride share, um, give me a text. I'll, I'm heading into town. I can take you. So that gets around some of the problems. Or book libraries or even just crazy art that attracts people to a space and makes it unique and different and unusual and, uh, and make, makes it something that stands out that people uh, are attracted to. So Great. there's some examples, yeah. Thanks, Jason. And I might, uh, Stacey, if you just have a kind of a minute and then I'll turn to Anna to kind of uh, bring us to a close, but what, what's the step we should do to get going? Yeah, look, I think um, if there is any time, it's now. We have proven that um, through COVID that things that we thought we couldn't do, we can. Um, you know, working uh, from home and all of those things. We've proven that now um, we can actually change if we need to. So we need to build on that momentum. But I guess my, my thinking is let's not do things the same way. We have a lot of creative people in Hobart. Uh, they're also underutilised at the moment through this pandemic. How can we get them to rethink some of our cities? So different creative people, different creative events. Uh, and we've seen through things such as uh, Dark Mofo that you can put things in, people won't like it, but they will adjust they will go out in winter when they thought they couldn't you can close down streets when you thought you couldn't if it's interesting and vibrant and different uh, so how can we tap into what we have in the city which is some really creative interesting people uh, and bring different ideas through so that we can get over that hurdle of we can't do it or we shouldn't do it thanks Stacey and Lord Mayor I turn to you to bring us to a close with your closing thoughts Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think we can take a, um, an example that's going to be happening this Friday is a good uh, a good start to this idea of let's just let's just do something. Uh, our Tasmanian young planners are actually running uh, a day all day um, on Friday in the Elizabeth Street area, quite close to the university. They're setting up these pop up um, interesting spaces in some of the parking spaces. Uh, around supportive businesses. Uh, so they're obviously bringing that creativity and taking the initiative. And so I encourage anyone who's in Hobart to support them on Friday uh, in the Midtown area of Elizabeth Street. And um, I'm hoping that with some state government support, we'll be able to work with those businesses and, uh, and create some more permanent uh, parklets, which will allow those businesses to have some outdoor dining uh, in this post-COVID era while we're sort of working out how much distancing we can have. Uh, and those uh, partnerships are really, um, those partnerships with the state government in Tasmania, in Australia, are really important because we do have the three levels of government uh, and state government is uh, responsible for transport and uh, have the bigger budget. So we really need to involve them in this, uh, this journey as well. 
So um, it's been a fantastic uh, discussion and I'm really uh, thrilled that we're starting this, uh, this series of City Talks. Uh, I'd like um, you to join me in thanking our moderator, Vice-Chancellor Professor Rufus Black, uh, and also our, our very special guest speaker, Sky Duncan, who just brings such an incredible insight into uh, interesting things that are ha happening in cities around the world and uh, inspired all of us. I'd also like to thank uh, our, my fellow panellists, um, Stacey Pennicott and uh, Professor Jason Byrne for your uh, insights here in Hobart. So we are at a time when we can think about our future uh, creativ creatively. Uh, as Stacey said, we've got lots of um, creative people in Hobart that are, that are really keen and proud of their city and keen to uh, ensure that it, as it grows, it hangs on to uh, some of the, um, the character and things that make Hobart really special and, and that balance of um, uh, innovation and, um, and uh, recognising what's special about Hobart is, is going to be so important to our future and I hope is a feature of our ongoing city talks that we uh, bring together some of the best practice from around the world but also work out what, what we want to take of it for Hobart and for Hobart's people. Uh, today's talk will be available as a video and a podcast via the University University's Island of Ideas website, which is now on your screens. And the City Talk series will continue. We'll be back for more uh, webinars and public talks. We're uh, working together and we'll be planning uh, an, our next City Talk probably around about mid-November. So if you've got any ideas about things that you'd like to see us discussing, or experts or uh, speakers that you think would bring some interesting ideas uh, to this conversation, please let us know. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us on our ev uh, first ever City Talks Hobart and uh, um, hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for attending.